So, you want to be an offensive coordinator in the SEC, huh? Well, just know, if things go south, you'll have to face the music. You are Locked On Gamecocks, your daily podcast on the South Carolina Gamecocks. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Today's show of the Locked On Gamecocks podcast is brought to you by Bet Online. Bet Online has you covered this season with more props, odds, and lines than ever before. Bet Online is where the game starts. Hello, Gamecock Nation, and welcome back to the Locked On Gamecocks podcast, your show for daily headlines and potential storylines on your favorite South Carolina Gamecock sports teams. I'm your host, Andrew Line, and as always, Thank you once again for making the Locked On Gamecocks podcast your first listen or watch every day. We are free and available on YouTube and wherever you get your podcasts daily. Now, of course, we've been talking a lot about the offensive struggles from this past weekend against the Missouri Tigers. And that particular performance seems to have become an inflection point for this South Carolina football program in terms of what direction should they go? Should they continue to stick by Marcus Satterfield and give him a little bit more time to see if he can right the ship before the end of this season? Or is it time to face the facts that maybe this isn't going to work out long term and it's time to move on? This is obviously a very big question that head coach Shane Beamer is going to have to answer at some point in time. And of course, when you have a bad performance like Marcus Satterfield's offense did this past Saturday afternoon against the Missouri Tigers, you're going to have to answer for that in front of the local media at some point. And that took place on Wednesday afternoon. Now, Marcus Satterfield was, of course, asked about the Missouri game specifically, but he was also asked a couple of questions like, what is it in practice that isn't translating into the football games? Because the players had said that they had had a really solid week of practice in the week leading into the Missouri contest. And, of course, Marcus Satterfield was asked how he feels the offensive staff as a whole has done up to this point in the season with their job performance. So I'm going to do what I did on yesterday's show with Jaheim Bell's comments and play all these clips with Coach Satterfield's answers to these questions in succession, and then we're going to come back and try to dive into this thing a little bit further. So here's what Coach Satterfield had to say on all of these points. What were your just general thoughts on how things went on Saturday just across the board? Uh, it was very disappointing, uh, just the uh, the production, the execution, uh, everything. Like, uh, I thought we had a really good week of practice. I thought our guys were ready to go, and we just we never could get going. Couldn't couldn't get a first down to stay on the field. Seth, you mentioned having a good week of practice, and it didn't translate. Where, as you kind of look back on it, where was the disconnect from a good week of practice to not really translating on the field? Uh, that's a great question. I wish I wish I knew that. Uh, it's what we're you know we're, we continue each each week each month uh, as a coach that you try to find like how can you make sure that your guys stay consistent. Uh, you know you always worry about that after you have a couple of weeks of success of making sure that everybody keeps that edge about them, uh, the strain about them. And I thought that our guys did. It just it didn't show up on Saturday. Marcus, you're about two thirds of the way through the regular season now. As you sit here holistically on this offense, how good of a job do you feel like you and the staff have done in, in trying to maximize this offense's potential? I mean, I, I think we've given it everything we've got. I think that we continue to work hard, and I think that you know, continue to uh, have the trust of our players. And I think that you know, we've shown games where we've we've been productive and ran the ball and threw it and caught the ball and scored touchdowns. And there's games where we haven't. So uh, we're still again. Not a young football team, but we're still early on in the stages. You know, Spencer's first year, and just trying to to you know build and mold what what we ultimately want to look like as an offense. You know, certain pieces have been available, certain pieces haven't been available. But uh, you know, I just think that moving forward, I think that you know, based on this week and how Spencer's attacked it and how everybody's attacked it, I think you know we're going to continue to get better. All right, so let's go ahead now and dive into these comments a little bit further. Firstly, you know, we're not going to really broach the Missouri game, obviously. We have hammered home the point of how bad that game was on the offensive side of the ball. That game's pretty much over and done with. Nothing the staff can do about it at this point. So, of course, Marcus Satterfield's going to say, yeah, it was a bad performance all the way around. I really want to start to 
um, get into the weeds of this whole thing with the second answer that he gave regarding what isn't translating from practice to the games. And, you know, I'm not trying to pick on Coach Satterfield here, but to be quite honest with you, if I'm a South Carolina fan, I would not like his response to that question whatsoever because at this point, you know, obviously some of these issues with the offense have been going on from week one all the way up until now. And, you know, we've talked about these in abundance on this show. You know, the inability for this offense to sustain drives, the inability to maybe get some explosive plays, the inability to really have a consistent run threat against, you know, some of the better teams on this schedule. And when you look into all of that, you know, it's tough to sit there and listen to someone who, you know, has now been in the program for almost two whole seasons now. And he's standing there and he's saying, I don't know what the disconnect is. Which, you know, again, I'm not going to try to really pick on that too much. You know, I'm not going to try to say anything like, you know, that means he's clueless. I know some of y'all will probably say that yourselves. But, you know, I'm not going to say all that. But I do find it concerning that, you know, with that answer... It just doesn't seem like that there's a whole lot of confidence in the sense that, you know, we're narrowing down what the problems are. And honestly, what I have noticed with Coach Satterfield and with the trends that have happened throughout this season, the thing that I think that he has been trying to do in order to make things easier, you know, he talked in this past offseason about how he needed to make this offense more college-like. And based on what has happened this season, what I think that – Satterfield was implying there was basically he just cut down the playbook in terms of the amount of plays that the team actually ran and didn't really change, you know, maybe the concepts themselves too much. Now, of course, there are, there are some more quick pop passes in this offense because of Spencer Rattler now being at South Carolina because that does fit his skill set a little bit better. But overall, again, it just seems like the one change he's made has been the number of plays. And, you know, that's good to a certain point, but... There's been a lot of talk from some of these games about how, you know, the opposing defense seemed to know what was coming. The offensive players saying in the postgame pressers that they knew what we were getting ready to run. Those are not the kind of comments that you want to hear coming out of your players, especially on multiple different occasions. You might have a game like that happen maybe once or twice every season if you're preparing the right way. But if your playbook is is that simplistic in terms of the few plays that you are actually running, then defenses, no matter, again, whether or not they're full of five stars or not, or maybe they have an all-star coaching staff or not, or support staff, they're going to be able to key in on that kind of stuff. All they have to do is look for a few certain tendencies, and boom, they've got some of your plays figured out from the jump. So I don't think I would like that answer if I was a South Carolina fan. And... The other thing in terms of, you know, the offensive staff having done a good job up to this point in the season and talking about the roster being young, this roster is not young. This offensive side of the ball, you had a lot of returning starters from last year's team. You had the entire offensive line coming back. You had Marshawn Lloyd coming back. You had a bunch of these wide receivers coming back. Jaheim Bell coming back. Those guys aren't young in this scheme. These are guys that have been here now for, again, almost two whole seasons in your offense. And yet, there's still not a whole lot of progression. Spencer Rattler, sure, this is his first year in a pro-style offense, which is much different from what he was running at Oklahoma in the air raid that Lincoln Riley employs. But... Spencer Rattler, this is his fourth year as a college football player. It's not like he's some true freshman who, you know, just got here a few months ago. So the point I'm getting there is this. I do not agree with Coach Satterfield's comment on the roster being young and having guys banged up. I mean, you want to talk about guys being banged up. Clayton White has had to deal with some injury problems on his side of the ball in multiple games this year. This offensive side of the ball, again, there have been a few, you know, nicks and bruises and maybe some guys that are playing hurt in a way. But for the most part, in terms of being able to play these football games, the offensive side of the ball has been, you know, knock on some wood, relatively unscathed up to this point. So, you know, some fans, the, the point I'm getting at, some fans are going to take these answers as just pure word salad at this point. They're not going to really buy into all of that. So, you know, I think if you're Coach Marcus Satterfield, 
You just got to look ahead to the Vanderbilt game. You got to try to find a way to get this offense to bounce back. And you got to put out a good performance against Vanderbilt. There's no excuse against that team. Vanderbilt ranks like dead last in almost every major defensive category in the SEC. And near the bottom of the barrel in terms of everyone else in college football. If you cannot score a bunch of points and drive down the field on those guys, then uh, yeah, what I brought up earlier about there need to be a decision made by Shane Beamer at a certain point in time, that timeline might be accelerated tenfold if you do not do that against the Commodores on Saturday night. And this Vanderbilt Commodore matchup is going to be quite the intriguing one because of all the factors for South Carolina and Vanderbilt both heading into this contest. What does Vanderbilt possess? How have they progressed this season? And also, in terms of the rest of the SEC, where does South Carolina currently stand? I'm going to be joined by Locked On SEC's Chris Gordy in just a few moments where we're going to sit down and talk about all of those topics. But before we get to the interview, I want to tell you a quick story about my dad real quick. When my dad was a kid, he got a BB gun. And a BB gun, of course, is probably one of the most prized possessions that any young kid could get. Because obviously, it's not like a regular gun, but you know, you feel so cool and euphoric when you have something like that to play with, of course, in a safe way. Now, my dad, unfortunately, had his BB gun stolen not long after he got it from people who had come by the house often and, you know, knew pretty much the layout of everything. And, you know, my dad was quite sad about that because, again, it was one of his favorite things growing up, one of his most favorite gifts that he ever got from his parents. And a reason why maybe, you know, the BB gun was not kept safe and sound is because back then... They did not have Simply Safe Security, the home security company that has earned the trust of over 4 million people to protect their home due to their cutting edge security technology, which is powered by 24 7 professional monitoring agents that can spot outside threats at a moment's notice. They protect your home whether you're there or on the go by alerting Simply Safe agents when something is caught on their HD cameras. They'll dispatch police or first responders in an emergency immediately using proprietary advanced response technology to confirm whether the threat is real or not. Simply Safe also offers advanced sensors for every room, window, and door in your house, which can not only detect criminal threats, but home threats as well. Like when your cat tries to jump up on that mantle that they're not supposed to jump onto, and they end up knocking over your potted plant, causing it to make a mess all over the floor. So, if you want to prevent that from happening in your own home, don't wait. Go customize the perfect system for your home in just a few minutes at simplysafe.com slash locked on college. You can also save 20% on your Simply Safe security system when you sign up for an interactive monitoring plan and get your first month for free. Visit simplysafe.com slash locked on college to learn more because there's no safe like Simply Safe. Welcome back to this Thursday edition of the Locked On Gamecocks podcast, where we cover your South Carolina Gamecocks every single day. I'm pleased to be joined by Chris Gordy over on the Locked On SEC podcast. Chris covers the entire SEC conference in just 30 minutes every single day, which is obviously a pretty difficult job if you ask me. I know I would have a pretty hard time with it. Chris is just the man for that, though, over on the Locked On Podcast Network. Uh, Chris, thanks for joining me today. Really appreciate your time. Yeah, thanks, uh, Andrew. And it's only going to get more difficult when we add uh, Tennessee and Oklahoma to the mix. So I'm going to have to do like an hour show every day or something to, to get it all in. But uh, yeah, man, thanks for having me on. Oh, yeah, especially with all with all the bad blood between Texas and Texas A&M and everything that's going on there, you know that that it might have to be at the minimum of 45 minute show to say the least. But Chris, let's go on ahead and get on right into it with South Carolina because obviously there's a lot of talk and a lot of negative talk surrounding the football program this week. It's crazy how the entire narrative around a football team can change with just one game. And it seems like South Carolina is going through that right now after what was a gut-wrenching loss to the Missouri Tigers and a game that quite frankly never felt like it was really close from the start to the finish. Chris, as someone that covers the entire conference from a bird's eye view, how did you perceive the Gamecocks loss to the Tigers? 
Uh, it was disappointing, but th- this is what happens in the SEC. I mean, when you're a team that feels like you've arrived, it's a team that feels like you're a little bit ahead of schedule from where you know people thought you would be. Shane Beamer has done a fantastic job there. But to have back-to-back <clears throat> huge wins over Kentucky and Texas A&M, and then to come home and you're ranked in the top 25 for the first time in a while, it was the ultimate letdown spot. I mean, you're looking at it going, ah, oh, it's Missouri. They stink. You know, we're, we're better than them. We, we should come out and handle business. And he just didn't. I, I give Missouri credit. Their run defense is one of the most underrated in the SEC, maybe the, the country this year. They've, they've done a really good job of slowing down some dominant run games, and they certainly did that this past week. Marshawn Lloyd's been one of my favorite running backs to watch in the SEC this year. But, man, he, he was like top five in rushing in the conference to drop to eighth. In just this one game because, you know, they held them to just 30 yards. So um, couldn't run the ball. You know, Spencer Rattler wasn't especially sharp. And I thought Brady Cook played hit one of his best games of the year. Dominic Lovett was was unguardable. And, uh, you know, for all the concern that you maybe had about Luther Burden and some of these other pieces, here comes Dominic Lovett. And he's been one of the more consistent receivers uh, in the SEC this year. So it was disappointing, but. I don't want to say surprising because, again, this is what happens in the SEC all the time. You you know, you, you have one of these games that you're just kind of glancing over, and suddenly you get that team's best shot, and a desperate team came in and played played harder. And you're right. It, it wasn't even – you kept going, okay, you hold them to a field goal. All right, it's still a two-score game. But South Carolina's offense just could not do anything. It was like, man, just go get a touchdown. You make this one-score game. But they just couldn't do it. And so, again, it's, uh, it's disappointing, but – you better bounce back and beat Vandy this week. That's all I know. Yeah, for sure. That Missouri-South Carolina game, uh, speaking from South Carolina side of things, it has been a very weird matchup because of just how close it's been, and that's probably the most lopsided game, Amelia, that's taken place in that series in several years now. But you are right. South Carolina's now got to find a way to refocus and bounce back this week because they're going to be facing a Vanderbilt team that seems like that they are an improved team based on last year. Now, obviously, the bar was set extremely low on this Commodores football program, but I think that Vanderbilt has shown some promise. So, based on what you have seen from them this season compared to what they did last year, where has that progress really taken place? Yeah, it's, I mean, overall, it was really that that earlier in the season stretch where they, uh, you know, they ran off the, the win over Hawaii and, and Elon and they got the win at Northern Illinois. But outside of that, I mean, they didn't really put up a fight against Wake Forest. They, they got blown out to Alabama. They looked good for a half against Ole Miss and then Ole Miss ran away from them in the second half. Uh, they got demolished by Georgia and then put up a pretty good fight against Missouri and uh, just couldn't get it done. Uh, they, they've kind of alternated quarterbacks here as of late. You know, earlier in the year, uh, it was Mike Wright, and he was the guy they brought to SEC media days. They thought he was going to be the leader of this team, and he looked fantastic through the first few weeks. And then he did. And then they transitioned to the true freshman, A.J. Swan, and he had some moments where he looked okay. And then that's when the bulk of the SEC schedule started ramping up, and, and he stopped looking good. And then this past week against Missouri – uh, or yeah, was it last week, two weeks ago, whatever they, mm-hmm. they looked, you know, they both guys played and neither guy really looked all that great. I think Mike Wright threw threw a touchdown, AJ Swan threw an interception, but, um, it, it's a mixed bag. And the old mantra is if you got two quarterbacks, you got none. So we'll see what happens this weekend against South Carolina, but this is a game where the Gamecocks need to go out there, take care of business. Um, you know, what does Vandy do well? They run the football pretty well with Ray Davis. He's one of the top rushers in, in the SEC. In fact, uh, Marshawn Lloyd, with his bad performance this past week, fell behind Ray Davis in the SEC rankings. Uh, Ray Davis, number seventh in the conference of rushing, and Marshawn eighth. But, um, you know, even the defense, I thought, was going to be a little bit more approved because that's Clark Lee's specialty. But, man, I mean, giving up 50-plus points in, in, in a couple of games already this year, uh, this is one where South Carolina needs to take care of the football. Spencer Rattler needs to um, let it fly, but don't don't turn the ball over. And I just look at on paper, this is a game South Carolina should absolutely win if they take care of business. 
Right. You, you are absolutely correct about the fact that on paper, South Carolina does hold the advantage here. South Carolina, if there's one team that they have been able to consistently defeat in the conference over the last decade, it has been the Vanderbilt Commodores. The Gamecocks have defeated Vanderbilt 13 straight times. And that's a longer streak compared to even some of the powerhouses in the conference in Georgia. And I even believe Florida, who lost to them at some point when Derek Mason, I believe, was the head coach there. So, Chris, when taking that into consideration – how hard the loss has been on South Carolina's players. Vanderbilt's coming off a bye week. Vanderbilt, again, they're probably not sitting there thinking, you know, yay, we're glad we're three and five at this point in the year. But, you know, there has been moments of, you know, glimpses of progress, you know, against really solid teams like Ole Miss that you mentioned earlier. So overall, do you think that this is the first time in maybe several years that this is Vanderbilt's best chance, considering the circumstances, to actually pull off the upset against the Gamecocks? Or do you think South Carolina does go out there and take care of business and harnesses all of the emotions from this last weekend's loss? Yeah, I think this is an absolute bounce back spot for South Carolina. Uh, I don't think they're going to play as poorly as they did a week ago. I think, uh, like I said, I think they're going to go into Vanderbilt. And, and look, no offense to Vanderbilt. They just, there's no home field advantage there at all. The fans' support has just been not what it needs to be the last few years. And look, the product on the field has, has been poor. Um, but I think this is one where South Carolina needs to go out there, go out there and, and, you know, wouldn't surprise me if they win big in, in, in Vanderbilt again. Get that ground game going, uh, get the passing game going. You know, the big story this past week to come out was, you know, kind of the drama going on with Jaheim Bell, you know, that he thinks, you know, he, he was supposed to be part of the big game plan this uh, past week against Mizzou, and he wasn't, you know, I think had nine snaps or something like that. So they got to get that in order. And Marcus Satterfield, there's going to be some tough conversations come in the offseason. But again, this is a game where they've got to, uh, I think they bounce back and they bounce back in a big way, get the ground game going, get Marshawn Lloyd going. And I think Spencer Rattler, uh, you know, in the, in the passing game, uh, you know, gets going and, and 250, maybe a 300 yard passing game for Spencer Rattler. I think this is a game where you could put together a lot of stats and uh, like I said, win big and get a little confidence before you have to go into the swamp in a couple weeks. Absolutely. This game could be what the doctor ordered for the South Carolina Gamecocks to try to get them back on the right track. But of course, with South Carolina, a lot of fans are now maybe a little bit more concerned about the long term outlook of the program. Again, there was so much promise with this team under Shane Beamer throughout last season, or at least the end of last year and going into this year, and it hasn't maybe lived up to that billing. So Chris and I are going to talk about all of that in just a few moments, but before we do that, I need to talk to y'all about our friends over at Sweatblock, who is one of the sponsors for today's show. Sweatblock is a fantastic product for people who might be dealing with excessive underarm sweat. And, you know, I mentioned it myself before. Obviously, I'm a guy that sweats a lot. If I do any sort of moderate to vigorous exercise, I could just walk for a couple miles and I'm I'm beating with sweat. I could go up a flight of stairs and I'm out of breath like I just went out there and ran a couple of miles without stopping. But there's some people who this affects their everyday life and it can really be a big inconvenience for them. So that's why you should try out Sweatblock. Sweatblock was created by a doctor who was dealing with the same issue and it's recommended by other doctors in the field. Not sure you can get a much better product than that. So if you or someone you love or care about is experiencing embarrassing sweat or odor that's getting in the way of everyday life, Try Sweatblock today and save 20% with the promo code locked on at sweatblock.com. Also available on Amazon. Welcome back to part two of this interview between the Locked On Gamecocks and Locked On SEC podcast. I am joined by Chris Gordy, the host of the Locked On SEC podcast. We cover your team or the entire conference in Chris's case every single day in just 30 minutes. Now, Chris, as I mentioned before the break, South Carolina fans are a little bit more concerned now about maybe the long-term outlook for the program because it seems like that this is a year where they haven't made as much progression as they would have liked to see. They're worried about this now becoming a lost season. 
Is there any chance in your eyes that the Gamecocks could right that ship? Wh whatever the case may be in that regard. Maybe they beat both Vanderbilt and Florida. Maybe they somehow pull together and find a way to pull off an upset against Tennessee or Clemson. Although right now, that probably looks very unlikely. And if they're unable to do that, what are the potential ramifications for Shane Beamer and the program after the regular season and or the bowl game they play in? Yeah, I think those are all great questions. Um, you know, looking at how the schedule shapes up the rest of the way, you know, the, you could almost call this this game against Vanderbilt a must win if you want to get uh, bowl eligible because, again, going to the Swamp, I know Florida is in a transitional year and they're kind of down right now in year one of Billy Napier, but that still is a tough place to play. We've seen Florida still put together some some nice home wins this year. And then the, the last two games against, you know, Tennessee who's ranked number one in the playoff rankings right now and then at Clemson to finish the year, both those teams are, are playoff teams right now. So it's going to be very difficult to win either of those. So I, I kind of almost look at this Vanderbilt game as you have to win this one to get to six wins, get bowl eligible because there is a world where you lose these last three and you finish six and six. And it's not going to get people excited. It's not going to be, um, you know, it's not going to be anything to write home about. But I will say, uh, if you could, you know, it, it puts a lot of pressure on that game against Florida. If you win against Vandy and then you can go get that win in the swamp, and then you lose against Tennessee, you lose to Clemson. You're talking about a seven and five season. I think that's pretty good. You know, it's it's a step forward from a year ago, and I think a lot of South Carolina fans would feel like pretty optimistic. Look, in, in my opinion, I'm a little disappointed what we've seen from Spencer Rattler this year. I thought he was going to be a lot better uh, than he has been. He's not been terrible, but he's not been great. You know, the guy who was the preseason Heisman Trophy favorite uh, two years ago. So um, I, I think you keep recruiting hard, and, and and certainly Shane Beamer is, and you try to find some special p talent, and you keep hitting that transfer portal. You know, it, it's good. You know, like I said, I don't know what the future is with Spencer Rattler. Will he be back? Is is he gone? Whatever, but you got to keep finding some special talent. And if you can find that quarterback that could come in and take you to the next level, you know, just thinking outside the box of Joe Burrow that came to LSU, uh, a Cam Newton that went to Auburn years ago, a special talent like that can, can make or break your entire program and turn things for the good for you. So, um, again, I, I think that would be the, the big upside if I'm a Gamecock fan. Beat Vandy, find a way to win in Florida, you know, try to look competitive against uh, Tennessee and Clemson, but if you finish the season seven and five, I think that's uh that's an absolute feather in the cap. Six and six isn't terrible. It's it's kind of you know where you were a year ago. It's you're, you're you feel like you're kind of just mediocre, not not moving ahead. But that's how big that that game against Florida is. If you find a way to win that one, man, seven and five would be uh, tremendous. Yeah, Chris, you make a lot of great points there. That Florida game could wind up being the biggest game for the Gamecocks this football season, considering where everything, what, what, what has taken place leading up to this point. So you mentioned Spencer Rattler, and obviously South Carolina's offense has been nothing to write home about. And for South Carolina fans, this is one of the biggest disappointments and not the biggest disappointment for them this year because you brought in, of course, Spencer Rattler, who, you know, no matter what people would say about him, he's a very polarizing figure to a lot of fans, but he's got a lot of talent. You brought in his buddy in Austin Stogner. You bring in a guy like Antoine Wells, who, you know, in my opinion, is one of the more talented players on that offense as well. You got Shaheen Bell. You have players on that side of the ball. And yet, despite that, this offense, it seems like, is stuck in neutral right now. So, Chris, when seeing what, you know, other people in the SEC are talking about in regards to other teams— what, in your mind, is the SEC's overall opinion on South Carolina's offensive situation? Is it maybe the players and they're not executing correctly? Or do you think that it goes deeper than that and it might be offensive coordinator Marcus Satterfield that is the problem here? I, I think I think it's Satterfield. Um, you know, I, I just I look at this talent on this team and, you know, keep in mind what we were talking about coming into the season. There was conversation regarding Jaheim Bell. And, oh, we're, we're going to get him utilized at so much many different ways and all this and it's been disappointing uh just that josh van was on the preseason award watch list for a lot you know a lot of these sec preseason watch lists everybody was like oh josh van he's gonna have a monster year he's in witness protection program this year it's like where where has he been so um it's about getting your best players of the football and to me coming into the year josh van and jaheem bell were two of your best players and for the most part they've not gotten them the football 
Uh, I love Marshawn Lloyd. Like I said, he, he he's done his part. But, yeah, I think a change at, at OC is absolutely on the table for South Carolina next year. And, you know, you got some money to spend. Let's go get one of the big hot names out there because, uh, and, and again, I'm not trying to throw Satterfield under the bus. It just, I feel like they've underutilized their talent. The offensive line has been a little tra- transitional. It hasn't been great at times. But um, again, to me, you got to get, when you have special talent like this, you got to get them the football. Uh, Antoine Wells has been, been fine. But um, again, I just, I, I, to say I've been disappointed in some of the play calling and just offensive productivity. Uh, it's kind of putting it lightly. Yeah, no, and, you know, of course, Jaheim Bell, as you mentioned, he only got nine snaps against the Missouri Tigers. He had zero touches in that game, and, of course, he has been a big topic of conversation over here in Columbia, South Carolina, throughout this week. Last question for you here, Chris. I really appreciate your time and all your insight that you've brought uh, on the show today. Um, obviously, we talk about this offensive situation, and you look just – you know, a couple states away in Tennessee, up in Knoxville. You look at what Josh Heupel is doing with that offense. Josh Heupel is, of course, a second-year head coach. You look down at Florida. Florida hasn't necessarily maybe had an offensive explosion this year compared to what they've been the last few years under Dan Mullen on that side of the ball. But Billy Napier, it seems like he's doing a decent job, at least, of getting you know, as much as he can out of Anthony Richardson for what he inherited coming into this season. And then Brian Kelly even over at LSU. Look, everyone talks about that game one. Everyone, you know, for some reason seemed like they were riding him off early. You know, this LSU team's going to underachieve. They're going to win six, seven games. They're lucky in that division. And now LSU's a top 10 team. Jaden Daniels has only thrown one interception. I saw that last night on the playoff reveal show, and I was legitimately shocked by that. So, these are all first or second year head coaches. And when you see all the offensive firepower and, you know, at least progression that's taking place in some of these programs, do you think that's added fuel to the fire regarding the offensive situation right here in Columbia? Yeah, that's an interesting way to, to put it. Um, you know, because when all those teams you mentioned, you know, what I look at is um, they like South Carolina, at least a couple of them have utilized that transfer portal particularly at the quarterback spot. When you go back to Tennessee, Hendon Hooker was a transfer from Virginia Tech that really progressed well in, in year one in Josh Heupel's system. And then this year with Alex Golish, they, they've taken it to another level. And uh, and Hendon Hooker's right there in the Heisman uh, conversation. At LSU, Jaden Daniels came in via the transfer portal, came over from Arizona State. And, you know, early in the year looked a little shaky, but – these last couple of weeks, he's taking his game to another level. At Florida, Billy Napier is already an offensive-minded coach. Anthony Richardson was a special talent that was already there. And so I look at all those and I say, okay, Spencer Rattler came in via the transfer portal. That's where I say I'm, I'm disappointed, where he's in the bottom you know, quadrant of, of, of production from SEC quarterbacks this year. You know, he's behind Brady Cook and and Anthony Richardson and K.J. Jefferson and Will Levis and all those guys in passing yards. And it's a tough bar to live up to because this is a really talented crop of quarterbacks in the SEC this year. But that's where I say, you know, is it offensive coordinator? Is it, you know, what is it? I expect Shane Beamer to evaluate all that this offseason and and make the moves necessary. But, yeah, you're right. I mean, how are these other guys having great success with their offenses and South Carolina is still kind of stuck in the mud? That's where I would say, you know, get into the transfer portal, find you an offensive lineman or two that you can upgrade this, this whole line next year, you know, figure out what you're doing with, with Radler. Will he be back? Or are we going to go dive into the portal and find another big name quarterback out there that could, could come in and have the impact of a Hendon Hooker or Jaden Daniels uh, in the SEC next year? I think those are all things kind of on the table. And, and also, what kind of coach is Shane Beamer? You know, is is he a guy who's going to be hands on with some of the stuff uh, offensively, or is he more? Hey, I don't want to. I don't want anything to do with that. Let's just bring in somebody who can who can handle all that. So, there's a lot of questions to be answered. But um, yeah, I, I would say you know, if you're a South Carolina fan, you're right to have a little bit of envy looking around some of these other teams and saying, why can't we do what those teams are doing? Yeah, exactly. And of course, no one is going to sit here and try to say South Carolina should be scoring over 45 points per game right now like Tennessee. What Tennessee is doing is otherworldly, but it's a fact 
more so that these offenses seem like they have an identity. Florida, they can run the ball really well at the quarterback and running back position. Tennessee, they can score a touchdown on any given play. I think anyone would like to have that kind of offensive identity every single week. And then LSU, they're going to play great situational football. They're going to be able to extend drives and, of course, get Jaden Daniels' legs involved in order to be able to do just that. Chris, really appreciate all of your insight and the time that you gave us on the show today. No problem, Andrew. Anytime, man. I can't thank Chris Gordy of Locked On SEC enough for being so kind to come on to today's show to talk about South Carolina's upcoming opponent in the Vanderbilt Commodores and also sort of how they could get the ship righted for the rest of the season and how they're comparing right now to other teams in the SEC. What were your thoughts on all the comments that he had regarding all these topics? And also, what is your opinion on what Coach Satterfield had to say at his press conference on Wednesday afternoon. I want to hear all of y'all's thoughts, as always, down below in the comments section if you're watching today's show on YouTube. And, of course, you can also shoot me a direct message at alion underscore sc on Twitter, and I'll be sure to respond to any reply or comment that you have for me on any topic related to South Carolina sports as quickly as I see it. And, again, I want to thank y'all for making Locked On Gamecocks your first listen today. And I do want y'all to go check out Locked On SEC. Again, Chris Gordy does a lot of great work over there covering the entire conference but for your next listen i want you to check out the locked on sports today podcast where the biggest stories of the day plus instant reactions big game recaps and the take of the day all take place this podcast is available on the odyssey app youtube and wherever you get your podcasts daily but once again y'all that does it for me on today's show i hope you all have a great rest of your thursday and i will catch y'all on the next show of the locked on gamecocks podcast